So the concepts of signs and symptoms are typically used interchangeably, especially within the patient community. However, in the medical community, their importance are distinct. While symptoms um, expressed during history taking usually serve as a guide to the practitioner on where emphasis are made during physical examination and investigation, the sign, on the other hand, is a pointer towards a working diagnosis. So what is a symptom? A symptom is an expressed observation of an experience or condition relating to the patient's physical or mental status and is typically subjective. Examples of symptoms could be headaches, um, pain, pain of any kind, loss of appetite, nausea, fatigue, restlessness, um, the list goes on. A sign on the other hand is an objective assessment of a condition relating to the physical or mental status of a patient and it is usually demonstrable. An example of um, signs will include fever, increase in temperature, the extremes of um, increased temperature, hypothermia, um, increased heart rates, tachycardia, decreased heart rate, bradycardia, increased blood pressure, um, increased blood sugar levels. Notice the emphasis on subjectivity when it comes to describing symptoms. Now, for instance, if a patient experiences pain, only that patient can tell you the nature of the pain. Only the patient can describe the magnitude of the pain and the features, other features regarding the pain, as there are no other way of assessing the pain. And so because of that subjectivity of symptom, there might be the tendency of the symptoms to be exaggerated or minimized. You might have a group of patients experiencing the same pain, nature of pain. Some group might choose to describe that pain as dull, another group as crampy, another group as achy. So in this scenario, there is obviously an element of discomfort that expresses as pain. However, the metrics for assessment are poor. On the other hand, for a sign, there is a demonstrable evidence of it, the presence of that alien entity. For instance, for a fever, this is demonstrable with the use of a thermometer, which not only establishes its presence, but can also quantify its value. If we have a case of high blood pressure, this can be demonstrable with the use of a sphygmo manometer. If there is a swelling, this can be demonstrable by um, measuring the, the size of the swelling by the practitioner. The practitioner can feel for the consistency and the nature of the swelling, the appearance of the swelling. So because these provide a more clear, concise, and consistent metrics for assessment, they are used as a tool for making a working diagnosis and for further management. They can also be used as a way of assessment of the success or progress of a treatment plan. Say for instance, a patient diagnosed with hypertension and is placed on antihypertensive. When they present for each clinic visit, their blood pressure is going to be monitored. Now the ability to uh, attain that desired goal and keep it sustained, the goal for blood pressure tells or measures the success of the use of that antihypertensive in addressing the problem of hypertension. Now the question might be, are there diagnoses that are made purely on basis of symptoms and not of signs? Yes, an example is chronic fatigue syndrome. This is actually based on severity and duration of expressed feelings of tiredness. However, to the exclusion of disease entities like anemia and other heart conditions. In other words, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Now the question is, why do you as an individual need to appreciate the distinction between signs and symptoms? Now there are several reasons, but I'm going to highlight a few. Number one is, your symptom serves as a clue to a medical condition. It's not necessarily a pointer to a diagnosis, and that's the importance of your visit to your primary care provider. Number two, certain mild symptoms or signs does not equate to mild problems. Say for instance, the presence of the change in color of a mole on the skin surface might not necessarily trigger the alert of an individual, but this might just be a cancerous process, i.e. melanoma. And it's only with the visits to your primary care provider that this can actually be um, noted or diagnosed. This diagnosis can be made. Also, there are conditions that might 
seem very worrisome. For instance, in newborn babies, that's what we call milia. This appears like a skin rash. And times most new parents seeing this become frantic until they're reassured by the pediatrician that this is only transient and it's most likely going to resolve on its own. So there's that case. And then thirdly, there's the importance of observing you, right? You notice your changes. There are certain changes that are subtle. For instance, weight changes, whether it's weight gain or weight loss. And at times it might take an, another individual that is constantly in your presence that might observe these changes. There's a need to monitor those changes, especially instances of unconscious weight loss, because this might just be a case of a systemic illness or who knows maybe even cancerous process so there's a need to be aware of such changes also other changes could be um, changes in appetite maybe a loss of appetite for women in the reproductive years changes in their menstrual cycle so these also need to be we need to be aware of these subtle changes and when necessary present ourselves to the primary care provider so the takeaway lesson is the need to unveil yourself to your primary care provider for at least that annual visit because you might not necessarily experience a symptom but a sign might be picked up by the provider that will trigger an intervention and hence avert an ongoing medical condition to complicate to a more serious condition. Again, I hope you found this educative and informative and if you've had, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.